You are listening to the BJJ Globe Charters Pirate Radio podcast, brought to you from Saint Bart in the French West Indies. We talk jujitsu, traveling, and people who do things a bit different in life. I am your host, Christian Grogard. Welcome to episode 18 of the PGJ Club Traders Pirate Radio podcast. Um, what's been happening since the last episode? Um, we actually managed to pull off a few camps and uh, quite big ones as well. We did the Caribbean Island camp in February, which was, uh, I think we were around 25 people or something. So it was like half, half size of usual, but... I mean, it doesn't really matter. We had a great time. Um, then we did Arizona camp in March, and um, that went really well. It was almost full capacity. And I think that was the first camp of the pandemic that just felt like a normal camp, um, probably also because we didn't have many restrictions and stuff in Arizona. So that was a, a really nice experience. And um, yeah, last week we just wrapped up the our classic camp in Maine which we've been doing for, I think, five years. Uh, we started in New Hampshire for two years, and then we did that in Maine for a, a few, uh, handful of years, maybe six years now, total. Um, and uh, it's a camp I always look forward to a lot. And um, unfortunately, last year, first we tried to postpone it, and then ultimately we had to cancel it last year and then just do it this year instead. But... But we came back with The Vengeance, and um, it was the first completely full camp um, Yeah, since um, we have to go all the way back to Caribbean Island Camp February last year. Uh, so it's more than a year, almost a year and a half ago, um, where we didn't have a full camp. But we managed to do it, and it was a great experience. I already... Um, negotiated the contract for next year so that one is definitely happening um and uh, looking forward to a bunch of interesting camps this summer and they all kind of look really good i know there are still some travel restrictions and for some people it's still not easy to travel or maybe they're holding back a little bit but um i don't care in a sense we're going to go ahead with all the camps <laughs> um and um if they're going to be n not as full as a normal year then that it is what it is you know we I um I think we can still make some great experiences out of it, and we see quite, quite strong, um, quite strong attendance uh, coming up for Iceland and Germany this summer. Um, Iceland is uh, there's like fifteen tickets left, so uh, we're almost there, and uh, the same for uh, the big camp in Heidelberg in Germany, which just opened the borders to Americans as well. Um, we're at six sixty percent of the tickets booked, so so it looks like we're gonna have a fun summer, which is uh, literally all that counts anyway for us, um, and very excited for that. But um, for this episode, I managed to do an interview I've been trying to do for years and years um, with a guy that probably all of you know, Chris Howder, and um, he's been kind of on the sideline of my jujitsu career. Um, literally since day one, for more than 20 years. Um, I've been trying to catch him for podcast probably since we started doing the podcast, but he's kind of difficult to get a hold of. Anyway, this time when he was in Maine for the camp, I brought a little microphone and I grabbed him before he was about to leave the camp and we sat in the forest for an hour or so and just talked about random things. So it's an episode I've been wanting to do for a long time. I'm very happy that it finally worked out and... Um, I'm just going to play the interview right now, and I hope you will enjoy it. All right, so I'm sitting here in the forest at the U.S. camp in Maine with Chris Howder, and uh, I actually prepared nothing. And I also kind of prepared this for three years because I was trying to recorded every year i brought my microphone i thought i'm going to talk to someone at the camp and i never got to talk to anyone <laughs> that sounds like what i do all the time exactly. right and i always thought hey chris is coming so so i'm gonna i'm gonna record something with him 
So for many years, I thought I should get you on the podcast. I also messaged you about it many times, but you don't see your messages. Oh, you then know. I message your wife, and then you forget. And then she informs me, and then I forget, <laughs> and then she'll ask me a month later, hey, did you, you do that? And I'll say, oh, shit. No, I forgot. And then I'm in trouble. So I could blame me being in trouble on you. And I think since yesterday, I've been running around to try and find you. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, when can we squeeze in an hour? Anyway, so here we are. And even with three, three years of preparation, I didn't prepare anything. But if there's one thing I know about you is that I just need to give you a keyword and then you talk. So that's so true. It's probably more a matter of me having to stop you from talking. I think that's true. And before we even launch in to that, I would say a lot of that comes from my childhood as a stutterer. Mm -hmm. If I had to read something prepared, there's no way I could do it. Impossible. And it took me into my... 20s to figure out that if I don't have a plan, I am safer from hitting a word where mm -hmm. I can't change it. Right. Because I, I, I do what um, what Porky Pig does. If I can't say, P -p -p I'll say that ham over there. All oh, right, all oh, right, right. Okay, well, that's perfect for this interview. Perfect. Um, and uh, just to set the scene, we're, at, we're sitting in the middle of the forest. The weather is amazing. Pretty much. No mosquitoes. No mosquitoes. And uh, we're by, alone by the fire pit. It's kind of romantic, actually. It is very romantic, especially um, with Christian. Yes. I could think of nothing more romantic <laughs> for... I put on nice clothes for you today <laughs> and everything. Anyway, let's, let's try to start from the beginning because... Uh, so, actually, when I started training jiu-jitsu around... Or it was not jiu-jitsu. I didn't know something was called jiu-jitsu. Maybe around 99 or something, to early 90, 2000. Yeah, it would have been I, uh, 99 or 2000, yeah. We literally just headlock, head, was headlocking each other, wearing scooter helmets. <laughs> that was literally the, that was the level of technique we had. And I was so intrigued by this because I did, maybe that sound is going to be annoying on the microphone. <laughs> you're right, you're, you're right, you're right. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I was so intrigued by it because I, all, I did like Taekwondo my entire childhood, just kicking holes in the air and then suddenly someone grabbed me and I was like what on earth is this you can grab people and I was just I just loved it ever since and um, and we were so eager to find some knowledge about this you know because we didn't know anything we we're just literally just headlocks and that's where I got my cauliflower ears only from back then and uh, I went online this was way before YouTube like nothing like even streaming video online was yeah. not possible impossible but I found your your uh, your VHS tapes. Were they red? They were in the red. You had I to order them. I, had to, I ordered them, and it took literally three months to get them. All the VHS tapes. It was T-shirt chokes and jujitsu for the street, and I was just blown away. It was like, wow, someone actually knows what <laughs> knows something about this, uh, and that was extremely inspiring. And I, I started looking for other material. Like early, there was a lot of like. Like Valetudo videos, yep. like uh, a lot of uh, like uh, speedos and all yes, that stuff. Yes, the Valetudo like, fight There was like the Ken, Ken Shamrock had some stuff. Ken Shamrock had something. And um, and Ezekiel I or um um um, um but Kazeka, he was this. He had an ad in every magazine. Yeah, yeah. And I had the Dan Henderson once. That's yeah. when I really like just I fell in love with the wrestling aspect of grappling with Dan Henderson's videos, also yep. the VHS tapes. And I was, we had like a, an old TV on a, you know, on a, one of those you could roll, what do you call it? Like a rolling yes, table the thing. Cart, the rolling yeah, yeah, with, cart. with a VHS player on it. And we rolled that in every training and watched your, your, watched your videos. Uh, and that's how my Jiu Jitsu career started. And I think what was interesting for me, or what kind of, uh, kind of uh, piqued my interest early on, was, uh, and I think this is how, also why I've kind of, kept that interest in your stuff ever since is your strange ability to think out of the box with many things with jujitsu and also not jujitsu but let's not imagine let's not pretend yeah. we're life coaches here no yeah. um but there was always an element of thinking out of the box you know like when i saw some of the brazilian stuff it was really good stuff but then you suddenly had a video on t-shirt chokes you know like choking yep. t-shirts like damn this is insane nobody else is doing that you know and uh, and all the kind of self defense stuff that I really I really like that stuff because it was so different from the sports kind of aspect of it which I also yes. ultimately liked but I just liked the 
aspect of thinking out of the box and kind of and because I feel I'm similar in a way you know if there's something is kind of everybody does it in a certain way how about we try to choke with a t-shirt instead you know or I don't yeah. like affiliation Some, someone should do something can we make it? what about we try to do it in a different way you know or something like that so do, am, am I right on this or what, what do you, you are right and um, I remember meeting you I didn't until you reminded me and sent me a picture. And I remember meeting I you in a Portland <laughs> and going, oh yeah, I do totally remember him now. And I remembered that you were shadowing Matt filming mm -hmm. um, because you guys were going to create a series mm -hmm. that, um, and I'm sure that part of that inspiration was from watching all those various VHS things. You, you, oh, 100%. And you're like, hey, I can too. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we didn't run into each other for years afterwards. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, you reached to me out of the blue because you were going to be in L.A. Yes, at some point. And we're going to come by. 2007 or something. Yeah. yeah my garage yes and i was like oh cool and at first i didn't remember who you were mm. i'm like oh but but it's some a guy from s the bg i thought right yeah. um there were many people at those camps this these, these camps are for the for the listeners maybe close to 20 years ago i went to these first yes camps and, and i'm gonna say this because i've got to say it if i didn't think that the globe trotters camps were the most welcoming and uh, coolest camps I would divert the topic into something else. <laughs> Which, in other words, if I was at some um, Joe Blutello's backyard wrestle-off camp, if I didn't think it was really cool, I wouldn't say it. I would say what I thought was cool about it. And um, so I think what you had was, and a lot of us at that time, when you concepted these camps was there was a paradigm shift happening in the entire reality martial arts world mm. and by that I mean wrestling, jiu-jitsu and MMA arts, right? That we all felt that it was isolated mm. and too tribal mm -hmm. and many people that we both ran across a lot and I would get a lot of it's like I'll say like right now I, I think I have 78 black belts under me 20 of them are a black belts who lost their home or who could no longer deal with whatever politics of whatever group they were in mm. that was it had run its course and <laughs> I often say in this Martial arts, and I'm sure it's not the only one, but it's the one I'm most familiar with, can be very cultish. And it's one of the only physical activities out there that adults pay adults to literally tell them what to do, what they can wear, and control them. Mm. You're paying an adult to uh, control you. And I always um, um, say, if you're wondering if you're in a cult, the question is, am I having fun? Mm. And if you're not having fun, or if you're having that icky feeling, you're probably in a cult. And I'm not saying cult as in the classic, you, you know, the, there's a guru and you're gonna drink Kool-Aid, but all groups have a cultish aspect. Mm. And, um, mm. I think that what you did came at such a good time and it, it, it was so in the zeitgeist mm. to create a camp where basically, and I feel as if I have a little inspiration but behind it. I could have never pulled off what you pulled off, but I remember you in my garage that time back in 2006 or seven or wherever it was, and I have spray painted on my wall, unaffiliated. Right. 
And I remember you looking at that being, that's cool. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm like, I don't know where it'll go. You, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, I'm kind of still stuck in, I, I need to be ranked in order to be able to sign things off. And mm -hmm. like, you, you know, I was like in, in a whole other mode of life. And um, through your traveling, because you'd been globetrotting and mm -hmm. experiencing all these different places. Mm -hmm. And there's where I think you and I have a similar experience. Because I didn't have a school, mm. I was a traveling instructor. Right. I got to see so many different little laboratories mm. of how you can do this thing, right? Absolutely. And um, what was my... You said so I, I put so many keywords in my head from what you said. But don't you think it's human nature that people want want to be part of something and, and people kind of want to be controlled in a sense, more, some more than others? I mean, you see how, how, how people get attracted to being in, in let's say, the military or yes. corporate world yes. or sports clubs or yes. like hooligans, you know. I like think people it, want to feel part of something it's and, and then grow within that. Huh? Absolutely. I, m m one of the wisest things my dad ever told me when we were kids we would watch all those animal shows mm -hmm. mutual of omaha's wild kingdom into the world of the chimpanzee right. and he said to me once if you want to understand humans watch the animals and if you watch the other primates you can understand our need for a troop community and tribe mm -hmm. right and I think, like everything, a tribalism can be a good thing and a bad thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And at small group levels, I mean, it, 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 it's how we took, I mean, it took us 10,000 fucking 250,000 years but to get to the, the point we're at now where you can record me on a phone mm -hmm. because of... A tribalism That's because right. one guy could not invent a phone even if he had all the knowledge he would need a team he would need people he would need experts in other areas and it, it's the old no man is an island mm. so we need others and it's kind of how you do that tribe it, is your group a welcoming group it's kind of why like people we all love right now zombie genre mm -hmm. because it's such the metaphorical representation of the types of tribes that will happen. The mm -hmm. paranoid, let no one else in tribe. Mm -hmm. The, we need other uh, bodies, but once they're in, they're ours. The, we want to welcome others, and they can go off into other tribes. We don't care. And it, it, it's that whole balancing act of the tribalism, I think, we're all dealing with. Yeah. Do you feel like this has changed a lot over the years? I mean, you've been involved in jiu-jitsu forever, so I feel that there's been a big change even in what I see for the last 10 years and 20 years back. Absolutely. I, I think, and we, we can call this my, my American slash European arrogance, but I, I do think that this thing we do of Japanese origin, Brazilian modified, American and now European influenced is what w where w we're at. When it was just a Japanese, it was one thing. Then it was a um, a Brazilian mm -hmm. evolution and speciation. Up until quite recently, it was very heavily Brazilian influenced, like maybe ten years ago. I think something. so. Like almost like completely overwhelmed. Yes, a, a Brazilian yeah, yeah. influence, right? But judo was out yeah. until a lot of uh, jiu-jitsu, more. I mean, they always did, but more than ever now, like, it first was wrestling, mm -hmm. where um, the Brazilian uh, jiu-jitsu culture, and I don't mean just people from uh, uh, so I mean, I mean wh whether, wherever you were, mm -hmm. when you were in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu culture, you tended to see wrestling as an adversary as opposed to a 
martial arts ally. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was true with uh, judo and other stuff. It was when I was up, coming up, even though I was an ex-wrestler, it was kind of like this thing where almost you had to almost reject wrestling publicly, but privately you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of a weird mm -hmm. thing, right? <laughs> you know, there was something to learn there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what do you, uh, yeah, because I feel like, I mean, maybe let's say the first half of, of the 2000s, like the first 10 years, I feel like the, when I started to run into BJJ, the, the politics were heavy. Like, uh, so, because there was also, this was before YouTube. You know? Yes, if, you're like, right. There was, techniques were money. Yes. Sense, right? and, and they were, and you could actually keep knowledge secret. And, you could. And if you wanted to, to, to give someone knowledge, they better give you something back, which would be, have to be representation. As, right, as, right. As, as packaged in affiliation. Right? And there were certainly not only regional styles mm -hmm. almost, but like I, I used to give this speech all the time, and now it's not important. But I used to say, if you went to, for a month, a Hoyler Gracie school, and then for a month, a Hickson Gracie school, and then for a month a Jean-Jacques Machado school, you're getting three different perspectives mm -hmm. of how to paint a face. Right. You're still painting a face. Yeah, yeah. And there's, because I would be off now, so what's the Gracie style? And I'd be saying, well, you're talking about 16 brothers and cousins who all have their own unique but personality and style and mm -hmm. stuff. The Gracie style is a brand. Mm -hmm. And Jean-Jacques Machado's game might look more like half of Hoyler's and half of Hickson's, and Hickson's might look more like the part of Hegan's with the part of Bacosin pure street fight Valley Tudo oriented. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was all... Um, it was kind of very isolated groups and, and it was isolated and, yeah and you could have it it's like i remember i learned the de la heva guard which i didn't even know it was called that mm -hmm. when i learned it um when i was a new purple belt which was very early mm -hmm. and it was pre-internet a pre not pre-internet but pre youtube pre-open source right and that guard carried me through into my second or third black belt stripe mm -hmm. until it became now a fundamental staple that white belts know. Right. And it was se secret knowledge that worked on an algorithm, mm -hmm. your sweep, your back take, your other things, and it was brilliant. It was like... And Secret I was weapon. almost sad that everybody suddenly right. knew it, even though I'm running around the world teaching it. Yeah, <laughs> I was still almost sad. Right. Yeah, I think I think that since before globalization of jujitsu, that's when kind of affiliation and and the tribalism part of it had had its height. You know, and and I would say even ten years ago. When I when I did my round the world trip, that was probably just around the time where I think things started to change because internet really globalized the sport. And uh, and when I still when I was traveling there, there was a lot of like I heard a lot of stories of people saying, "Wow, you, you can just travel and train where you want." What does your professor say about that? It's like I don't have any professor. Right. <laughs> and I uh, remember, you, yeah, and, you were one of the early n nomads in this. There were others, which were, are often called Ronin in the mm -hmm. Japanese samurai world or Creonch in the mm -hmm. Brazilian world, which is much more derogatory. Mm -hmm. Ronin was cool, mm -hmm. <laughs> but a Creonch was a guy who a belt shopped, yep. who went from school to school, would hold their knowledge, get a belt, and then screw over their coach and go get another belt. Right, And I think just... Around that time, that's 10 years ago, I still heard a lot of stories about that. Like people who went on holidays and they went to train somewhere and they came back home and, and their instructor was angry that, that they did that. Um, and that was kind of also where Globetrotters just started to happen because I, I felt like, I, so suddenly I found myself in a position to become maybe someone's instructors, you know? 
and uh, and I, I just felt I don't want that. You know, I don't want to be in that position. I don't want to build those relationships with people. And and also, should I be in some kind of affiliation? And and honestly, I was like, I don't want to. I don't. I don't like that whole thing. Um, and that kind of gave birth to the whole globe thing. It's like, right. like let's try to do things a little bit different. And in the beginning, it was very much like let's do this as an as an we don't like politics, do whatever you want kind of thing. Who wants to be in on this? And then as the years pass by and jiu-jitsu are even more globalized, it becomes less and less kind of relevant in a sense. And, I, and back then I remember many people approached me about it and they were like constantly talking about jiu-jitsu politics and stories about all this stuff. And I was like, I, I guess like having a statement that you're non-political is in itself being political. Right, it right? is. And it just consumed me. Where it's, there was a point after some years where I said, I, I just, I'm not going to talk about jiu-jitsu politics ever again in my life. It's just a waste of time to sit and right. trash talk on the, that course. the teams. It, it's like... With the old adage, you're not gonna wrestle a pig without getting shit on you. <laughs> and the pig likes it. Mm -hmm. The pig likes b wrestling in shit. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you win the pig fight, yep. you're still shitty. Yep. Right? And that's the problem when we engage in these things. And you, you see, for me, myself, as a guy who loves the philosophy of politics and ideology. And coming through uh, jiu-jitsu, of course, I'm watching it play out and engage in it because I have this almost lofty m mission that I'm not going to change groups. I'm going to help change single uh, humans, not overnight, but to get conservatives to not hate liberals, to get liberals to not hate conservatives. Mm -hmm. It's that media, I remember once, like a few years back, I took one of those personality tests where it, it parameters all the thing and it said, your job would be a great ambassador, a mm -hmm. mediator. Uh, be, because I really, even my own opinions, I don't really believe 100%, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just know that I don't, have that much power right. over thought, mm -hmm. e including other human beings, right? Yep. Which is, again, and, and I'm going to go back to this, the globe trotter camps are hugely welcoming uh, camps. And I remember at a point when you, before you, you had your first USA camp, you were partially a bit nervous because Americans can be brash mm -hmm. there is the stereotypical cartoonish american right yep. which i have been <laughs> and uh, because i'm american so right you know and the european camps and other camps it's like will this work in america mm -hmm. and it it worked absolutely fucking fine right did, yeah. because everywhere in the world and especially at the time when your first america camp I came because I recall meeting a bunch of, it was that same thing. People were sick. I just had literally an hour ago at lunch, but speaking with the two women who one of them had recently just left to school. And I say that it's like a bad relationship. Mm -hmm. You don't know it's bad until you're out of it. Right. And then you realize, God, that was a horrible relationship. I was never happy. It felt abusive. It made me a worse a person. And I think it's hard to get out of relationships because loyalty is as strong as a trait as egalitarianism. Mm -hmm. This was something I thought we could also talk a little bit about that I feel like is under addressed in jiu-jitsu is, is, but very, very kind of uh, a strong mechanism that happens in what we do is these uh, relationships between people where there is a, dif what do you call it, a, a difference in power. Yes. Uh, that is something that I find is, is difficult to juggle with, and I see that people also end up in very bad relationships, and they stay in it, as you, it was a little bit like mm. what you said. Mm -hmm. Because it's jiu-jitsu with the 
kind of ranking system and all that stuff, it is designed to create relationships where one side wants something from the other side. Yes, or Very one strongly. side feels literally because it's what, what jiu-jitsu is, mm. controlled and submitted yes. by the other side. I, I, I mean, that's ultimately what we do is literally the purest expression of the power struggle. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it is we learn that we, we fear what we don't know. So by like knowing and feeling that every day where some days you win, some days you lose and you, you get a sense of the power of struggle. And I always thought it was strange that because it can manifest either in a hierarchy because what we do is a hierarchy on the map or it can manifest in a more group let's bring up the whole fucking group right and then for you as the leader that puts you in an awkward spot because in one sense yes you are the, the you, you have to run this thing mm -hmm. and it can't but be a democracy mm -hmm. it can't be everybody has an opinion at once and i personally think you you're excellent at that and that and globe trotters would be an entirely different feel and structure had the leader been someone other that, than you. Mm. And I think, and that is the, um, let's, we'll call it the group manifestation of your expression of the art of jiu-jitsu. I think the, um, I think at the point where I, where I finished that round the world trip, I got my black belt around just shortly after. And there was like a point where I s became a little bit famous in a sense. You did. And people were very interested in inviting me for seminars and stuff. And I started to get a lot of work like that. And um, I started traveling a lot to teach. And, and then I could see where that was kind of heading. It was heading towards the usual route of me becoming someone's professor and, and then you're going to start your own little tribe and having a <laughs> and having affiliates affiliate <laughs> academies and they will keep inviting me every year it's like this is nice nice i actually start making money off teaching jujitsu and it was tempting because it was like well this could become my business you know because they would if i build a relationship with them where they want belt promotions for me yeah uh, they will keep inviting me back maybe one day I c i'm not cannot promote them anymore and they will probably not invite me back anymore. So where did that relationship go? Uh, luckily, we invented another hierarchy on top of the old one, which is just stripes on black belts, so we can keep it running. Right. Um, that is, that's <laughs> the course. Yes. And then you realize, oh, shit, I'm aging, and there's all these new up-and-coming champions. Yeah, yeah. So I've got to somehow either fit them into my pyramid mm -hmm. or grow new at the bottom of my pyramid mm. and because I got to get paid because yeah. pretty soon I can't teach anymore. There's yeah. too many at the top of the pyramid. So you got to build a new one on top. Right. And the new one is based on time. So you cannot, you cannot overtake. No one can ever skill. get it. Right. It, it really is an MLM. Mm -hmm. It is an MLM. It is. Exactly what it is. But it, so I, I ended up in that situation and I was really struggling with it because I saw how many unhealthy relationships were built on based on, one side really wanting something yeah. from the other. In this case, jujitsu promotions. It's fucking Amway. And and I was struggling with it. And I think that was early on where I decided I will. Belt checker. Uh, yeah, that was early on where I decided I will. I will not promote anyone. I don't want to do it. I'll do it with my own students, but I don't want like satellite clubs and affiliate yes. students and people who invite me and take me out for dinners all the time. So in hope that I they, do they, that. I know. We'll get to that. <laughs> and yeah, uh, and, and I could uh, tell you how I try to my best to gently navigate exactly. without that, that's where being my a question fascist, is, that's where my without question becoming is going. a fascist. Yeah. yeah, that's where my question is going. <laughs> so I, so I really, I'm really super sensitive towards this. I don't want those relationships with people where they hope that I will give them something, and ultimately one day what I can give them will run out. You know. Yes. Uh, and that's also why with Globetrotters, I just. I, I could have built a completely different business. It is the, we have the most affiliates in the entire world of any affiliation. I could have built that differently where I would 
involve belt promotions more. Like yes. the opportunity of someone to climb the hierarchy through the power that I right. give them. Uh, and that could probably make me rich, I guess. But It, it, it could have made you rich, but it, it, it uh, obviously, as I think you're leading to, it, it would have also walled off mm -hmm. your original idea and it would have made you a hypocrite. Exactly. And I think that's why from the very beginning, I had to set those rules for myself of how to do those things. And, and if, I mean, now and then here and there, we do uh, some belt promotions at the camp, but it's someone who maybe they don't have anyone to train with and then all the instructors agree on it and I stay completely out of it. I, I'm not even involved in it. I don't even vote for the, for, the, for the thing because I don't want to put myself in that position in the group. Yep. Um, and I feel like you agree very much on that, but also you, you have kind of dug yourself into that hole a little bit more than I have. Yes. So how do you manage that? Because I feel like that's really difficult to manage that, that relationship with people who, who want something from you so badly, you know? It is. It, it, it's, and, and I like to always use extreme examples. And I will use no names because yeah, please, we that's don't, not we fair. Don't. There's, there's no names and no negativity in this podcast. But, but, but I once had a student who still, every once in a while, like maybe once a year or every other year, he will bug me because he wants to be under me. And, and it, even, even just that expression is weird. I, who are, I you, who are under, you under? Right, why do you want to be under me? I it's am like, under this guy. Yes. You know, it's, it's very submissive already. It's, it's already creeps me out, right? right. <laughs> already there. It's, it's yeah. really weird. Someone is over and under each other. It's kind of... And I, I've over the years but told him many times that because he's... I met him through one of my... I'm going to call him a, a brother black belt, mm -hmm. being a guy that were from the same lineage, right? Who couldn't handle him anymore and warned me, don't take him on as a student, you'll regret it. And the guy tried to wedge his way into us and he came to me as a blue belt and wanted his purple belt. So he was belt hunting, I also knew that. To make a, the, a long thing short, because I don't want to overanalyze it, but it basically, I had to learn through that, that I set a boundary, but I don't want to have it be a hostile boundary. Mm -hmm. I just said every time I really think that it would be best if you started at a brand new school and just did what they want. Because what it is, and I told him, is you're trying to, to actually tell me how to lead you. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to actually, if we're going to call it a power structure... You're trying to actually place yourself above me, but telling me what I need to do for you, mm -hmm. which is sick, mm -hmm. right? That's a sick codependent relationship there. <laughs> yep. And I don't want any part of that. I, I don't want to be in control of you. And I don't want you to try to pressure me to do what you think I need to do for you. Because then you're controlling me. Mm -hmm. Even though you're saying, you, you, oh, no, coach, I want to be under you. No. You're already in control. You, you actually have not surrendered the ego that wants to control mm -hmm. your destiny. Mm -hmm. So give that up mm -hmm. and just go with a flow and start something new. And right. that's kind of what my best advice but to anyone who feels like they need that hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And that's from the, I will now say, the underneath side of the power structure relationship but what do you feel from your side of it like because we all know we all know the stories of those who really want the belts and yes like all that stuff and they want something and it's already it's that's already kind of weird but but how do you manage that on a personal relationship level because you're involved with so many people and i totally i i totally see why you're there and why you want to be there and and also it's not for me but I also wanted to, maybe, you know, my, the, 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 no, the alpha monkey saying, yeah. in me wanted to sure. also want to do that, but I also don't want to, but... I mean, I, I think, like, in, you know, one of the most valuable classes I ever had was a military leadership class. And what made it so valuable was not just the um, curriculum and all that, but there was one old colonel who came and spoke and he spoke of 
the types of leadership and all these things. And in essence, what he said when I was young was you don't realize this now, but this is actually the most important class you will ever have in your life. Right. More than learning the machine gun and all these other things is l leadership. And I can almost promise you that most of you th have a concept of what you think that is and you're wrong about what is good leadership. Mm -hmm. Because good leadership isn't having people look to you for direction. Good leadership is fostering adults and other leaders. So in a short cleanup of this, my way out of that is I'm not trying to lead you. I'm trying to turn you into a leader. Mm. That's my mission. Not to control you, but to help facilitate your uh, jujitsu growth, your personal growth, without controlling you. Right. Because I think it's, that's exactly the point that I am like super sensitive to not end up in that role, but I also see that you manage it well, more than probably anyone I know, to still have like genuine relationships with people where you're not like, because you, at this, this stage in your career, you trained for such a long time, you could put yourself on a pedestal as some kind of super sure. sensei. I got enough stripes on my belt, and, and so like w one of the th things I often observe, whether I'm at a camp, seminar, w whatever it is, even last night, that I'll start to talk, and people will feel like they can't not agree with me or they mm -hmm. can't interrupt me because of this ranking thing. So when I start feeling that, I know that I need to either shut up mm -hmm. or say, look guys, if you th think I'm wrong, let me fucking know because otherwise you're doing me, you pretending as if I know the fucking answer is not helping me, right? right? And because I don't want to become a tyrant mm -hmm. who thinks they know the fucking answer, right? But Game of Thrones, one of the, and most of these people I'm sure have watched the Game of Thrones, but because we were all watching it, us, if, or if you were in the pandemic, <laughs> you, you binged it. But like, um, 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 but Daenerys the Targaryen is the, the example of how the tyrant that, that takes over with the tyrant originally, all their intent was benevolent. Yes. Right? And it's very, I can see how easy it would be to fall into that trap and that role, especially in jiu-jitsu. Maybe less and less because, because it's, it becomes less and less special to, be, yes. uh, to have jiu-jitsu knowledge. You know? I think that is... But in, in our age of jiu-jitsu, I can totally see how it was... And I can also see where it comes from, from those who were like, who were actual tyrants on top of a affiliation structure. Yes. Uh, where that comes from. And, and I, think, I think you managed really well at not falling into that role. I'm not saying that everyone else is a tyrant. You know, right, but, right. But, but we, we all see the trap right there in front of us. You know? Yes. And it's very easy to step into it. Because, I, I mean, I personally really uh, do uh, believe, my big uh, picture view is, in 60 million years, or what is, I, I don't know the exact, 600 million years, the sun will swallow the earth. <laughs> All this is fucking gone. And that in the grand scheme of things, we, our sun is l literally a one single spark in an explosion of a firework. And it's that quick. So, so I, I, I like to always start with the big picture. <laughs> And then, I mean, really, right. really yeah. fucking big, right? Uh, that makes good sense, yeah. And so, really, what is my quote-unquote legacy, right? right? It's a burned-out spot in the middle of space. <laughs> <laughs> and so, having that first, mm -hmm. then it, it, it can kind of humble me a little bit. So, okay, I'm playing a game with all these other humans. Mm -hmm. And then I got to ask myself, do I want to be a dick? Right. Does it make me feel good? Because at a selfish level, 
we are worried about how we feel. Mm -hmm. Does it make me feel good when I'm a tyrant? And for me, the answer is no. And I'm sure there's some people out there that that makes them feel good, being in, in power and in mm -hmm. charge. Mm -hmm. and, and, all that. And, and this is, I, I, I really do believe this is a bit of nature, a bit of nurture, life experiences, how you're, um, after the what break of the billiard balls, which way your ball went, mm -hmm. you almost have little uh, control of. And so I can also look at the tyrant and not judge them because that's just the way their ball right. went in the break. And then I can say, I'm lucky that my ball landed near a hole mm -hmm. <laughs> and no one else hit my ball off course. Right. Or it, when it did, I managed to regain a, what I call an ethical compass. Yeah. Not a moral compass, an ethical compass. Yeah, and I think that, as you say, people end up in different, they end up taking that power and doing different things with it. Once they become, a, they, they, they find themselves at the top of the hierarchy. The, the problem is when other people get swallowed up in it and they don't feel like they can get away from it. Like yes. you say, you're having a conversation at dinner and suddenly you feel like, oh, nobody wants to say anything because... They can, don't want we, to not agree with me. They, want, they don't want to not agree with you. And you know, already there, there's like a little magnetism there. You know? and, if yeah. you, if it, and if you were like had bad intentions with your, with your role in, in that group, you could keep them in you know, for, for years right. and years and years. And, and that's where... Abuse... And then if I were sick, like we know is out there, mm. I would go, I'm going to poach these students. Exactly. Which is why then no one wants to have open camps because they're afraid that some charismatic a tyrant with a bunch of stripes on his belt and a world champion thing is going to come by and poach them. And I've watched, one of the greatest YouTube things is of a guy who just opened up his, I think it was a book Carlson a Gracie school, you, you know, poured all his money, all his energy, all, all his his thing. The school just opened up, been a month, finally had a, a group of students, finally earning a living doing it, and literally across the street, because he has his iPhone, a camera, he shows, and the Mendez brothers opened up there, and last week I lost three quarters of my students. Right. Because loyalty is a thing that is fleeting. So I think because people feel like they have to press for loyalty, that's what creates that structure mm -hmm. that becomes sick, right? And I'm not quite sure how you navigated it so well, but you're the billiard ball that was at the right place at the right time where enough people were sick of the loyalty game mm -hmm which is the tribal game, which is the structure, that people wanted to be free of that. And for me, because I also know that there's the yin and yang balance, there does have to be somewhat, I'm going to call it a structure, not a cage. Mm -hmm. And that structure is something that, as I say all the time, when I teach, you learn the rules so you can break them. Right. So you know when it's appropriate that you break the rule. When Chris Howder gets to be a fascist and say, <laughs> nope, this is how we got to do it, guys. Yeah. I don't know. I mean... I, but I, I think that's the, 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 the core of the problem is when people get caught up in bad relationships and they cannot get out because of that hierarchy you know yes and 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 i i i literally hear stories about people who, like women who has been sexually abused yes. by their instructor but they stay but they stay and yes. and uh, and very often and that's an extreme example but there's also someone say i just absolutely despise this guy when, when i get my black belt i'm gonna leave yeah i've heard that one right. too I mean, it all started with just one affiliation ever, right? And they all left. Yes. Right? And I, I, th I think that the number one time to, to, that people leave, break up relationships is once they get their black belt. Once they're, once they're yes. set free. Right. 
<laughs> until then second degree now because <laughs> right because then the hierarchy changes you, you it. can hold him for another yes. six years i always like to say a couple things it's like for one whenever i, I, I i'm going to use loosely what but the word wrap a black belt around one of my students i say this is not the leash this is ultimately the removal of the leash. Because the only people that say, oh, don't worry what the belt you are, just enjoy it, are black belts. <laughs> Be because even if you're loving being a brown belt or a purple belt, there's part of you that knows that you're on this supposed journey to get these belts. Yeah. W which is one of the things, the, the beauties, when we contrast this with wrestling which has no belts or boxing which has no belts they just eliminate that whole thing but then when you're in those you feel the absence of the hierarchy mm -hmm. and the hierarchy often manifests in other ways and one could say it's more meritocracy based because now the politics are gone and you're earning that belt be or, or that place on the wrestling team because you beat the guy out mm -hmm. and there's the meritocracy war within the, the, the jiu-jitsu uh, community it's it and it's like in the early days i don't remember the exact verbiage but you expressly were told and knew that not everybody gets to be a black belt that's just not and not because of politics because if you can't hold your own against the next higher belt, you don't get that belt. Mm -hmm. And we've crept into this entire thing because of structure, money, and wanting to grow groups. This thing where the belt now is becoming a time and grade thing. It's, it's like if somebody's been at a belt for so many years, we got to give them the belt. Mm -hmm. And I also always say, whenever I wrap around a belt, it's that... Remember, somebody gave themselves the first black belt. Yep, that's a very important point. Somebody <laughs> just made this shit up yep. <laughs> and said, I'm going to wear a black belt, and now I'm at the top of the pyramid and I can make other belts. Yep, until there's too many others at the top. And then you wear a corral belt <laughs> or a red belt. And it, and this not... literally some of the belts literally have gold stuff on it. Yes. The silver, then gold, then it's like, you can't make that shit up. It's like worse than, than it's, it's, it's worse than the traditional martial arts that we love yeah, to hate. No? It r reminds you of a of a Colonel Gaddafi style <laughs> military <laughs> dictatorship, right? <laughs> I'm gonna have gold epaulets. I'm gonna give myself five m m m big old <laughs> medals. It's like I remember thinking this that when all of a sudden medals on the podium got really big right. because like the olympic the medal is is you know it's a relatively small thing it's what four centimeters across mm -hmm. it's not this huge gaudy thing the size of a trash can lid and everything got really blingy mm -hmm. we'll, we'll call it bling right whether it's pop culture or medals or and athletics i've always believed in that sports should be something about honor mm -hmm. and here's the let's call it the liberal in me and i don't mean in the political sense of what of what sean hannity calls a liberal i mean in the classic liberal european egalitarian rule of law guy is the rules of the game are more important than who wins. Mm -hmm. That's a, a perspective of intellectual liberalism. And God, there's got to be another word now because that word's been ruined. But the, that, and the opposite of liberalism isn't conservatism. It's illiberalism. It's, it, it, it's on the y-axis, not the x-axis. Mm -hmm. And people confuse that. Because 
you are either open-minded, fair, and we aren't going to cheat, or you are a tyrannical, unfair, and are going to cheat. So I think that leads us into, in all sports, when sportsmanship is gone, when the means justify the ends, that's where you leave the cart. That's where, even if your intentions are good, because you know if you could just get to the goal, I'm going to free everybody, mm -hmm. but I'm going to cheat along the way, now you've lost the spirit of your goal. Right. So win, lose, or draw, go down with fucking honor and integrity the best you can. And hope you get a big bling medal you can post. And on hope social, in the end, media. yeah, you can stand on the podium with a giant fucking bling. And when you win, pound your chest. And when you lose, cry and pound the mat like a fucking child. Mm -hmm. And be worshipped by a group of, I want to be a badass. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I both know, because we've had this chat on and off for fucking years is that's the gross part about what we do. It, it, that's the icky part. The, the yeah. I, always, I also feel that, you know, that you mentioned that these symbols of achievement and ultimately symbols of, of your position in the hierarchy are just, just weird, you know? Once you see it for what it is. Yeah. Like belts, for one thing, but also medals and podiums. I mean, I, the example I'll usually use is imagine a competition with no podium pictures and no medals. And not even announcing the winner, but we know who the winner is. If nobody wants to do no, that. No, why? Yeah, isn't that weird? It's also uh, even even belts just like weird me out so much. You know. Me too. Why do we have to wear them every day? It just it's literally just so it's like it's like a medal or a certificate or anything else. Like if you were not there once I solidified my position in this hierarchy, here's the symbol to show it. Here's you know? the symbol. Yeah, it's it's a it's a leash. It's an attachment. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a hyper object link. And which is one of the things I thought that's so cool about S Sambo is you have a gi but no belt. Only one title, Master of Sport, right? Yeah, that's I cool. mean, that's actually but kind of cool. Of course, it would only come out of a culture that had communism. Of course, yeah. But so what, so, so, uh, <laughs> but, we, but we also play along with it. Yeah. I mean, uh, so because everybody loves your old belt that has so many stripes on it. I it, love it, my it, old belt. It gets all those likes on Instagram, yes. you know, because that's like, oh, that's, that's, that's a certain status that I wish I could get one day, you know? But well, I love that belt because it's art. Mm -hmm. I don't love it so much because of, of it represents being high on, on the pyramid. That's a good point. I love that belt because it's got a molecule of sweat from everyone I've ever rolled. Yeah, that's disgusting, Chris, by the way. I know a lot <laughs> Let's of, not take that talk. But. I know a lot of people think that's gross, and that's fine. <laughs> but but th there, there will be no other belt that is that belt. Anyway, I think that is a very important distinction as a symbol of, of status versus, uh, as you say, it's like result of putting an effort into an art. It's kind of different, it is. in a sense. So what do you so so? Let's if we get this on tape. Yeah. Are you, are you gonna wear a coral belt or a golden, golden striped something when you get there? <laughs> there are literally gold gold stripes on them, literally. Now first it's the six silver stripes and then it's the gold and then. It's <laughs> yeah. Um. What will you do? <laughs> yeah. Because. We want it, but we don't want it because it's so fucking silly. Uh, right. Uh, look, if they hand me Colonel McCaddafi's <laughs> jacket. <laughs> it's literally what it is. I'm Let's gonna... put as many medals on this jacket as possible. That is what yeah. the call bill did. I'm going to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> we got that on tape. But, but goddamn, am I not going to take myself seriously? <laughs> It just so it's the absurdism of life, right? It's absurd. You know, we, we, laugh, we laugh at, you know, sometimes there's pictures of traditional martial arts and they have like 100 stripes on their belts, and, but it's no different. It's no different. And this is even worse because this is based just on time and not on actual skill. It is. It, it's based purely on 
I always say it, if you want your well, corral belt, all you got to do is not step on the wrong guy's dick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, because you also need to keep a relationship with someone. Together. Yeah. That's, that's the key. You need to stay alive and you need to maintain a relationship yes. with someone. That's higher. And not piss off. And like one could say the entire with Joe Morera wing has been almost banished from the rest of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu world because of politics. I don't know who's right or wrong in it. I don't really care. I'm just saying if it, it's one of those things where, you know, a Stalin would erase the people out of history mm -hmm. who were once his allies. Would like literally before Photoshop have guys airbrush the, the <laughs> people out of pictures. Right. <laughs> And um, so being cast out of the monkey troop mm -hmm. means death in the jungle. Yes. And that's kind of, I think, our, our innate the fear of being cast out of a group, mm -hmm. which is also the power of a group, is every member knows, even the leader, when they're in that very primal base, they know that the next alpha male mm -hmm. will come, like Andre Galvao, mm -hmm. and the slap heard around the world. Yeah. Right? That's right. It's that alpha male has now been out alpha. This younger lion mm -hmm. has said, now I, I want to take the Your spot. Yeah. spot. And that's like, I mean, we can play that game, but I would rather be like my personality the test re reveals as a mediator, mm -hmm. one who bridges gaps between warring tribes, one who facilitates a communication and doesn't attempt to lead by anything other than example and advice. Mm -hmm. It's like good parenting. I'm practicing. <laughs> yeah. God, I, I'm not that great at it. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I feel like with those, those, uh, the stripes on the black belt just weird, weird weirds me out. It know? weirds me out too. I could, I could have 100%, you know, if I was, if I had a different kind of, as you say, if my, if my, if my ball on the pool table had ended a little bit different, I would have come to you at some point and said, Chris, I want to, I want to be under you. Right. Which is weird for adults. And, it, it, it and I want you weird. to grade me. And every three years, I'll probably post on social media a picture. Oh, this memory. Can't believe it's been almost three years since my last grade. And it tech would have been an <laughs> awkward conversation. It would be so weird. And it would have been a weird thing. And But this is normal in the right. digital world. Right? And there would have been times where you would reflect and say, well, I'm glad I'm under a Chris and not fucking mm -hmm. with Joe Tyrant. Yep. And you would say, yeah, it, 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 it's... We could yeah. not, we would not have the same, same relationship. No. Because it would be based on something else than just friendship and training. It, right. Regardless of how untyrannical I attempt mm -hmm. to be, I would buy you more lunches. You would still <laughs> buy me more lunch. Yes. I would still feel like I could request something of you that yes. others weren't allowed to. Yes, yes, for sure. For sure. And I would probably, I would poke you less on certain questions. Yeah. Like, it would be awkward if I asked you if you wanted to accept a call build or not. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you're but right. But I think in that sense, also as an experiment for myself, because I also... In instinctively would like to have these stripes on my belt when I'm, let's say I'm at an open mat and nobody knows me, I say, oh man, if, if they only knew, this is my monkey brain saying, if only they knew I've been a black belt for 10 years, they, they would roll yes. with me differently. Well, that's the thing too, is like all my black belts, all of them, every single fucking one, they definitely know that they could call me on my bullshit. Mm -hmm. None of them yield but to me in any of that way. I mean, just think right here at this camp between Ben Westerch with Joey Vizente and Eric Bydark. All three of those guys 
will fucking laugh at me if I'm acting like a clown. Mm -hmm. They'll be like, come on, you're a fucking clown right now. They will argue with me when they uh, don't agree on either how to hold the arm right or fucking on what's the best economic course of the United States. So I want that relationship, mm -hmm. right? And again, it's like I go back to that guy that wanted to be under me so bad that got his belt from everybody else and he's like, I want to be under you. No, I don't want that. <laughs> right. I don't fucking want a guy... But coach, I'll promote you. I'll help your business. No, I don't want somebody helping promote me. Right. Right. I don't fucking want that shit. If it's organic and we have a, a uh, yeah. I would say maybe one of the uh, most liberating things that happened in my jujitsu career in the most recent half of it, like the last 10 years, was actually when I washed my belt so many times that the red part started falling off. And I was like, I'm just going to let it fall off. And eventually it fell off and I don't have it because it's like that symbolizes where you put the stripes. That's like, You're I'm right. out of that game. You're out of that game. Out of that game. Yeah. I'm not interested. No. I, I'm not playing the second pyramid. At least in like, if you want to be a fifth dan in ninjutsu, you have to dodge a sword with your eyes closed, you know? <laughs> For this, I just have to stay alive and, and kind of uh, kiss ass, you know, be someone's friend. In a strange way, usually. In a strange way, but yeah. But it's really nice, it's really liberating to get rid of that whole thing. And I would hope, it would be my wish, maybe one day in Jiu-Jitsu, that a black belt would just be a black belt. Because I feel like so much weird stuff comes with that extra hierarchy. That's like, Me it's too. like separate from, it's completely separate from the colored belts. Which I feel like have an actual real meaning. And yes, good much function more for, so than for competition. this pomp and circumstance it is. role it's of, like, of, of these. We all say, oh, jiu-jitsu belts are real because it's, it's true performance, which is true for color belts for the most Somewhat. of the sake. But, but, then, the most part. but then later on, we're, we're all so deep in this that we get sucked into this other system where it's literally based on nothing. Well, here's, here's the thing too. Like, I've been asked this a lot. So, because of whatever relevancy I have in the a community, largely based upon the internet, mm -hmm. people know who I am. They know when I got my belt. So for me, whether I have one stripe on my belt or 10, it's not going to change the fact that Chris Howder was one of the original guys who got the belt. Right. I've kind because of... Because you have, you have that simple of your status from elsewhere, through celebrity, celebritism. Right. Which is another weird thing. Uh, very. And you have cemented your status. Correct. Through your own journey. Correct. Not through following the, this heart. And people will often ask me like, hey, how come um, so-and-so has more uh, stripes after you when he was a blue belt when you were a new <laughs> black belt? <laughs> And I'll say, because he's closer to the source, right. or he's part of the original family, or he's w whatever it is. And, and then they'll ask me if that bugs me, and I'll say no. Or people will ask me, hey, that so-and-so guy, he like found a really big name and gave him 20 grand in a, a Caribbean va vacation, and now he's a black. Doesn't that piss you off? And I'll say no. And honestly, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not going to attach myself to a symbol. If somebody awards me a stripe or a belt, that's one thing. But if I'm going to attach myself to that's who I am, I'm Chris Outer, fifth degree black belt, which I'm supposed to be sixth now, but... I'm dealing with politics. Fifth, fifth and a half degree. It's like saying I'm, right. I'm 18 right. in two months. Because <laughs> I'm dealing with my own politics right. of it all. And I always but tell all my guys, I tell all my uh, colored belts, if you really want a stripe, stick it on your belt. You can put them all across your belt. You, you can have a tiger striped uh, a blue belt. You're still a blue belt. Until you get the next color 
all the stripe is is a, to let a a coach know to keep track of everyone mm -hmm. so i know oh my god so and so now has four stripes on that belt should his game be better mm -hmm. what does he need but to do but to adjust his game and the black belt uh, stripes from my perspective this is just mine is each stripe you should mentally wash yourself of all the bullshit, all the knowledge, everything you know, and you start again. Because each stripe apparently represents, depending on which family you're in, <laughs> three years, three years, three years, five years, five years, and that, right? So one could say that each stripe is like white to blue belt, blue to purple. And so each one of those, renew yourself, and don't use it as a hierarchy tool or a prestige thing. Use it as something to humble you. Like, oh shit, I just got another stripe on my black belt. I feel like I don't fucking know enough jujitsu yet. Right. But as you say about identifying yourself with a symbol of status, one thing that I actually find interesting is how literally everyone will say, I am a black belt. Or I am a blue belt. That's weird. Introduce You're right. I am. That is what I am. They don't say, I have. I've practiced this sport and someone once gave me, said right. I was at a blue belt level. They will say, I am a blue belt two stripe. They won't even say I attained mm -hmm. the level of. Or a, black yeah, achieved belt. it, or, or that's where I compete. Because I think part of us knows, especially after stripes on well, black belts, knows that we haven't achieved anything other than a symbol of time mm -hmm. that I think the healthy way is again to reflect on that time now and say wow I've been a black belt longer than from white belt to black belt but to say that that the in the iPhone is closer in time to a t-rex <laughs> then the T-Rex is to the Stegosaurus. Right. <laughs> That's right. And then go, oh, okay, I'm, th these stripes give me a tool to reflect right. on my life and the big picture. Not something to narrow me and wear as an identity. Right. Yeah. It's Which is why most of the time, my belt, if it's my old one because I don't want to wear it out, once I roll, once that knot unties, I don't put my belt back on. Right. I leave it off. Mm -hmm. It's not an important thing. I want you to have a place where you can grip my jacket. I don't want you to have to fight my jacket out of the belt or we have to break and stop and stick it back in the belt. Right. It's unimportant. But we, st but we say it's unimportant, but we also still start every class wearing our symbol of... of of rank, right? You do. And it's literally, you know what I the find, the funny connection I, I always find is, if you take kids to a playground and they don't know any of the other kids, the first thing they will talk about with the other kids is, how old are you and who is tallest? True. They will measure the height. They and do. they will just check, oh, you're six and a half, I'm six. Okay, let's play. You're right. This is, this is how a jiu-jitsu class starts. You walk in, okay, you're a two-stripe purple, you're a three-stripe brown. We got that settled, now we can play. Now, I like what Hickson said once a couple years back. We lined up, we bowed to Halio, and he said, and I like this a lot, I'm not bowing a submissive bow. I'm not bowing an allegiance, but I am honoring the course of where I am, right? So then that gets into the thing like, even let's just say you hated the, the jiu-jitsu hierarchy. You could say, I wouldn't have a jiu-jitsu if it wasn't for this thing. Mm -hmm. That's true. Right? I don't think jiu-jitsu would be the same success without it. Because I don't think so either. It, it definitely attracts people because of it as well you know? yes. because because humans want to be part of something a tribe and then they want the ability to grow within that tribe through hard work yes that is the, that is the sense of human achievement yes 
And that is why we sell, democracy we sell that itself so well. yeah. is an aberration in human history. <laughs> it's a freaky aberration as a result of, of a couple enlightened Europeans who looked back and reread the Greeks. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's just one of those strange things. And I'm an existential, I'm an optimistic existential absurdist where my, my mental gymnastics route out of everything mm -hmm. is to realize that it's all absurd. It's all Colonel Gaddafi's jacket. Right. I think that wraps up very much like what I also do in Globetrotters, you know, or just for myself in Jiu-Jitsu. It's just take that step back out of it and try to see it for what it is and then realize this is absolutely weird how we all, what we all do and then step back into it and just right. play the game but be aware of it. You know? It's like what could not be a more brilliant idea that you had of the a belt checker, mm -hmm. but what could also not be a greater threat to the current existing order. No. And, and I'm sure, as I, you've pondered, because you're a smart guy, that, that you, you know belt checker itself is going to be full of pure flaws and, and things. But, but, but what, what it does that I love is it so points out the absurdity of the other structure. Right. It gives a contrast of... And I believe in contrast. I'm an artist. I believe that white is only white because there is black. Right. That beauty is only beautiful because we contrast it with horror. And so from just that philosophical art of perspective, and with that we will wrap this up because I got to take a piss. Um, I think that wherever Globe the Trotter's direction goes, whatever my combat base, loosely affiliated place that you could join and be somewhat unaffiliated or independent, wherever any of this goes, wherever the IBJ, the JF falls on its sword and the Olympics finally acquire this as a sport or whatever, um, let's just watch the movie. Right. And, and occasionally, you and I get to be actors in the film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we get cameo roles. That makes good sense. Even talking parts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we got that. We get talking parts in, right. in the movie, right? We're not just background figures. That's right. Yeah, let's wrap it up with that. Right. I think you have a seminar to go to. Yes, I do. Someone is here to buy you lunch. Here, I, I got it. Okay. Like Thank you, Chris. So that was the interview for this episode. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm very happy to finally have had uh, Chris Howard on the podcast. Uh, he's someone I always, uh, someone I look up to, and someone I, I always uh, find very interesting to uh, to talk to about all sorts of things. Um, if you want to check out more of uh, Chris's work, I highly recommend you check out CombatBase.com. Um, his new website where they have um, online um, courses and uh, instructionals and stuff. It's always very inspiring to see what he comes up with because he's really one instructor who I feel like consistently have been thinking out of the box about jiu-jitsu and martial arts, uh, combat, combat sports, uh, ever since I saw his first VHS tapes. That's almost 20 years ago. Wow. All right, um, I'm going to wrap up the episode here. If you want to find out anything else about what's going on in the BJJ Globe Trotters community, I recommend, I recommend you, you check out the Facebook group, uh, members of BJJ Globe Trotters, or of course, just our website, bjjglobetrotters.com, where you can see everything about uh, upcoming uh, camps that we host and also just how to get in touch with people around the world. Uh, who would like to have visitors or maybe even travel to visit you. Um, it's a big community and there's a lot of resources and it's uh, pretty much all free. So uh, please go ahead and use it. And I hope that now the, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel of the pandemic. And uh, I, hope th I hope this means that more people can, can come out, go out in the world and uh, 
and uh, travel more with jujitsu again because it's a wonderful thing to do. So anyway, have a nice day and uh, I will be back with another episode. Who knows when? Might take a long time or might be soon. I don't know. Have a good day. Bye.